Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. The more I read and learn about the pre-pottery Neolithic, the more I'm surprised just how advanced the people were in ancient Anatolia. We know they could quarry and carve elaborate T-shaped pillars, we know they were laying concrete-like terrazzo floors, sometimes on custom-built foundations. We know that vessels and statues were carved and decorated in splendid fashion. They had well-defined permanent and portable art. And in a recent video, I laid out a new hypothesis that there may have been a form of central heating at Karahan Tepe. These people were planning large projects and completing them to extremely high standards, which shows organisation within communities. But at Gebekli Tepe, there are still no signs of domesticated grains, and so full-scale agriculture was still a future development. Still, many commentators suggest that Gebekli Tepe could not have been the work of mere hunter-gatherers, even though the evidence suggests otherwise. I believe we need to stop thinking in a binary fashion, that there were hunter-gatherers and then farmers, like something happened overnight. There is a grey area in between, a period of time that may have taken many centuries, and Gebekli Tepe and many of the pre-pottery Neolithic sites do fall into it. These people, this culture, were accomplished hunters. And yes, there is evidence of seasonal feasting, but now it's looking more and more likely that Gebekli Tepe was home to a settled community. No, not a metropolis, and no, not a city, but probably something akin to a village. According to Dr Lee Clare, we found middens, fireplaces, hearths and lithics, all smelling very domestic. For me, there was domestic activity from the beginning right to the very end. It's unlikely to have merely been a seasonal cultic centre of religious feasting as is often said, a place that people went to at specific times of the year. There is without doubt a domestic element to Gebekli Tepe, and it was most likely a permanent settlement. But saying that, and it is an unusual sight, there were more domestic finds than anyone expected. This picture from Laura Dietrich's new book, which I've linked below in the description, is known as Gebekli Tepe's Rock Garden where all the basalt grinding stones and limestone troughs and other large pieces of work stone, mostly for domestic purposes, have been moved to for storage and analysis. This garden is the size of a football field, with more than 7,000 grinding stones, 650 carved stone platters and vessels, and some of them were large enough to hold up to 200 litres of liquid. Yes, 200 litres. Talking to Nature, Dietrich said, No other settlement in the Near East has so many grinding stones, even in the late Neolithic, when agriculture was already well established. There was a whole spectrum of stone pots, of every thinkable size, and she believes they could have been for grinding grain to produce large amounts of porridge and also beer. Yes, Gebekli Tepe was a settlement, but the amount of stone objects indicates that food production looks to have been happening on almost an industrial scale. And I personally don't think it was just to feed the people that lived here, and certainly not exclusively for special occasions like annual feasts. It's possible that Gebekli Tepe was more than a settlement, that it had a very specific function in the landscape. I suspect it was something like a food processing centre for the wider population, that people lived and worked here, preparing food for communities in the landscape, like a centralised centre with a very specific role. I've personally long believed that the circular enclosures were food storage structures, maybe one for each local tribe or community, but I have no way of confirming this. So what was being processed at Gebekli Tepe? What do we actually know about their diets? Well, over the past few years, researchers such as Laura Dietrich at the German Archaeological Institute in Berlin have helped to fill in the gaps. 
even before grain was domesticated. The wild varieties were very much a crucial part of the diets of these people. According to an article that was published in Nature last year, Dietrich discovered that the people of Gebekli Tepe were likely making vatfuls of porridge and stew. These people were heavily reliant on grains and other starches, and they were being ground and processed on almost an industrial scale at the site. The research that's gone into this has been extensive, and involves everything from microscopic analysis of ancient tools, to analysing DNA residues inside pots, and we now have a better understanding of people's diets. The grains found at Gebekli Tepe were all of the wild varieties. As stated, domestication had not yet taken place, or maybe it was in its very early days, and the painstaking research has helped experts understand what crops were growing in the vicinity, what was being processed, and what was likely being consumed. We know there were wild varieties of einkorn and barley being processed. We also find the remains of almonds and pistachio, not to mention the meats that were consumed, which I'll come to later in the video. But of course with such an ancient origin, organic remains of Gebekli Tepe are few and far between. So, to get a better understanding of ancient diets, Laura Dietrich looked at the problem in another way, and first looked to recreate the tools that people use to make food. She started with a replica grindstone, a block of black basalt the size of a bread roll, and she photographed it from 144 different angles. She then spent many hours grinding around 4 kilograms of einkorn wheat kernels, photographing the stone as it was put to work. A software program produced 3D models from the pictures, and she discovered that grinding fine flour for baking bread leaves a different finish on the stones, compared to producing coarsely ground grain, which is ideal for boiling as porridge or brewing beer. After handling thousands of Gebekli Tepe grindstones, she was able to identify what they were used for simply by touch. What she found out was that people at Gebekli Tepe were mostly grinding grain coarsely, just enough to break up its tough outer layer of bran, and make it easy to boil and eat as porridge, or ferment into beer. So, is this what was made at Gebekli Tepe? Well, to see if it was possible with known pre-pottery Neolithic technologies and techniques, Dietrich commissioned a stonemason to carve a replica 30 litre stone vat, identical to one that was found at Gebekli Tepe, and using heated stones, she and her colleagues successfully cooked porridge inside. The team also brewed Neolithic beer in the open vessel, using hand-ground germinated grain or malt. The results were bitter but drinkable. So, from analysing grindstones and other plant processing tools, as well as the organic remains themselves, it was clear that the inhabitants of Gebekli Tepe knew exactly what to do with grains, how to grind them, process them and cook with them. These people were not living an agricultural lifestyle, but were also not traditional hunter-gatherers. They were clearly at the stage in between. They were more like proto-farmers, not a people who were experimenting with grain for the first time. The grinding stones were also very well made, they were absolutely perfect for the specific job, being efficient and effective. The pre-pottery Neolithic people knew exactly what they were doing with cereals and grains, and they were clearly well beyond the experimentation phase. Technically, we can say that hunter-gatherers built Gebekli Tepe, but the work mentioned in this video is all really important, because it changes the perception of what hunter-gatherer actually means. It's not a simple term with a simple meaning. The climate was changing, lifestyles were adapting and diversifying, and social practices as well as population organisation were evolving. Yes, the grains that were found at Gebekli Tepe were all of the wild variety, and yes, there is plenty of evidence they still hunted animals, but these people were more like proto-farmers, and life was clearly becoming more structured. 
As stated, evidence suggests the Gobekli Tepe was a settlement, but due to the vast amounts of grain processing tools and vessels, far more so than what would have been needed for the amount of domestic rectangular enclosures, I think it's very possible that Gobekli Tepe was more like a food processing plant, allowing wild grains and cereals to become a daily staple for a wide population. It was clearly not some rare treat. I like the idea that Gobekli Tepe was the brainchild of the leaders of the local communities who worked together to look forward, who came together to create this one place, a settlement where the people that lived there had one job of processing food for the wider population. Maybe the food collected by each local community was brought to Gobekli Tepe and placed in their own specific circular enclosure, or maybe the food was put into each enclosure after processing. Each enclosure could have been decorated to reflect the iconography of each local village, tribe or community group, as we know that different animal reliefs dominate each enclosure. For example, in building A, snake images dominate, in B is foxes, in C we find mainly boars, in Enclosure D, the imagery is more diverse, but we do see more birds. And in Enclosure H, we find a dominance of felines. Maybe the imagery on the pillars was a way to catalogue what was being kept inside each enclosure. A different enclosure for each community of people. Maybe Gebekli Tepe Enclosure H, with its dominance of felines, was earmarked for Karahan Tepe whose large enclosure is dominated by leopard depictions. Maybe the feline was the symbol of Karahan Tepe. But away from grain and cereals, there is of course evidence of meat consumption at Gobekli Tepe. Asiatic wild ass and aurochs were eaten, but archaeozoological data hints at large-scale hunting of the gazelle, the most abundant animal remains at the site. As you may or may not know, gazelles are migratory animals, and there is evidence of mass killings when they were in the region between midsummer and autumn. This was a mass killing in a short space of time, and the excess food may have led to an annual feast at Gobekli Tepe. So feasting did likely take place, but there were unlikely gatherings planned in advance for things like astronomical phenomena, like solstices and equinoxes but more likely when vast amounts of food were available. Feasts were likely strategic, in seasons favourable to the natural availability of plants and meat, and what better place to hold an annual feast than at a food and beer processing site for the wider population. Although there is no obvious source of Gobekli Tepe, the people would have drank water, and an 8 by 3 meter rainwater collection pit has been found by archaeologists. Maybe it was also the responsibility of the local communities to bring water to the site for the workers when they dropped off their grain and cereals for processing. There is tentative evidence for the consumption of alcohol at Gobekli Tepe, and around 80 shards of stone drinking vessels have been found, thin walled and decorated and often made from greenstone. These may have been from the feasts that were held here, and not used in everyday life. It's been so difficult to condense the information available into a video, but I do hope it's given you some insight into the diets of the people of Gobekli Tepe. I'm really trying to understand the site, what it was and why it was so important, and I have to say that a food processing centre seems to be the best fit. In truth, there is so much more to say, so much I haven't covered, and if you want to know more, I've left some fantastic links in the description below. The thing to take home after watching this video is that the inhabitants of Gobekli Tepe were masters of food processing and from the vast amounts of finds in the rock garden, where grinding and processing wild grain and cereal was on an almost industrial scale, well, it makes me think that this was a planned and supported operation that served the wider population, and not just for the people that lived and worked here.
There were likely feasts between midsummer and autumn when local communities came together to consume vatfuls of beer and porridge to accompany their newly hunted barbecued gazelle. These were new age hunter-gatherer communities whose lifestyle was propped up by the proto-farmers of Gebekli Tepe. Again, the pre-pottery Neolithic people were sophisticated and intelligent and nothing like the old-fashioned hunter-gatherer picture that is often painted. And, in my opinion, we do need to think differently when we view the pre-pottery Neolithic culture of southeastern Anatolia because they were clearly far more organised and advanced than we ever thought was possible. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.